God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. This should be a familiar quote. These are the words of Friedrich Nietzsche in his work The Gay Science, wherein he expressed his sentiment that Europe was experiencing a profound cultural crisis. Nietzsche argued that the concept of God as an arbiter of truth and morality had been undermined by human intellect and achievement, but in humanity's attempt to maintain structure and guidance, the vacuum left by God and religion's absence had been occupied by what one might call secular religions, such as nationalism, socialism, anti-Semitism, and belief in democracy. However, there's one big umbrella term that we can use to characterize all of these secular religions. Ideologies. According to Nietzsche, humans had divorced themselves from one religion and replaced it with another in the form of ideology. And despite the fact that humans believed that they had liberated themselves from the delusions and ignorance of religion, their new ideologies had blinded them just as equally. To see this phenomenon in action, we can turn to the Russian Revolution of 1917 and its foundations in Marxist principles. Now, for those not in the know, Karl Marx wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto, in which he attributed the massive disparities in income and living conditions to the capitalist economy. In such a system, society was divided into two groups, the upper-class bourgeoisie and the working-class proletariat masses, the haves and the have-nots, if you will. As the upper class, the bourgeoisie was a tiny minority in control of both the state and the economic means of production, meaning that they were exploiting the working class for their own gain. So Marx said that the only way to achieve economic equality and social harmony was for the proletariat to overthrow the bourgeoisie, socialize the means of production, and establish a government run exclusively by the proletariat. This was exactly what happened in 1917. Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and the Bolshevik Party led a revolution to overthrow the governing body of Russia and set up the Soviet Union, a state governed by the working classes. This is where we come back to Nietzsche. God did indeed die in the Soviet Union. But while Nietzsche argued that religion had simply been discarded, the Soviet Union actively suppressed it. According to Marx, religion was a false consciousness, a lifestyle that distracted from the class conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. And this is where we come to the crux of the issue, as devotion to religion went, devotion to Marxism took its place. Religion was a delusion, the opiate of the masses, and when the veil of religion was lifted, humanity would see reality as it truly was, a series of class conflicts. Never mind Marx's failed predictions that capitalism would consume itself if left unchecked, or that proletarian revolutions would happen worldwide. According to Lenin, Marxism was true, it was unquestionable, it was reality. Eventually, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie took on identities beyond social classes. The bourgeoisie was the oppressor class. They were the ones who trampled on the working class. They were exploiting the proletariat for their own gain, and this made them inherently evil. Thus, the proletariat was morally justified in overthrowing their oppressors, and they could do no wrong. They were the good guys, if you will. So, followed to its logical conclusion... This good and evil dichotomy justified exterminating any person engaged in activities that were considered counter-revolutionary, such as opposing or disobeying the Soviet government, disrupting the government's activities, or organizing uprisings against the government. This oppressive side of the regime appeared early in the Soviet Union, with Lenin's Revolutionary Tribunal, which had jurisdiction to punish counter-revolutionary agitators by means of censure, deprivation of civil and political rights, or execution. This became known as the Red Terror, which mainly targeted individuals embroiled in revolutionary conflict and the resulting civil war. It may not have actively persecuted the bourgeoisie, but it was certainly meant to ensure its defeat. The persecution of the bourgeoisie truly began during the reign of Stalin, in the period known as the Great Purge. Joseph Stalin, Lenin's successor, was convinced that the Soviet Union was under attack from its bourgeois enemies, both from within and without. Thus, Stalin sought to remove the bourgeoisie from all Soviet institutions. He created affirmative action programs for working-class students. He removed high-ranking engineers and economists, what he called bourgeois specialists, from the industrial sector because they advocated for a more moderate economic plan than Stalin's five-year plan. And every time one of his initiatives for rapid industrialization or collectivized agriculture fell short, he blamed it on what he called wreckers, the bourgeois conspirators who were out to sabotage his policies. And you could be a wrecker without knowing you were a wrecker. If one of your friends or family members was a wrecker, you were a wrecker. And if you didn't call out the wreckers quickly enough, you were a wrecker. 
and if you didn't toe the party line to a T, you were a wrecker. Stalin persecuted the wreckers mercilessly, and the state executed roughly 600,000 Soviet citizens, by a conservative estimate. Or 1.2 million, including those who died in detention at the state prisons called gulags. And in Stalin's eyes, this was justified because no matter what, the bourgeoisie was the enemy, and the wreckers, the bourgeois specialists, would always try to oppress the working classes and undermine a perfect proletarian society, even if the facts said otherwise. The people working in industrial plants and collective farms, they were laborers and peasants, proletarian as proletarian can be, but as soon as something went wrong in one of these plants or farms, those proletarians, if they were suspected of sabotage, suddenly became bourgeois, because only the bourgeoisie could instigate sabotage, and they really must not have been proletarian at all, despite their socio-economic position that would designate them as working class. You see, Stalin had to bend reality around his ideology so that his Marxist worldview would be upheld. And the thing is, Stalin's move to purge the bourgeoisie out of the Soviet Union kind of worked. After a generation of working-class students had been propelled into the academy, after the bourgeois specialists had been cleared from industry, the next generation of Soviet citizens was a generation loyal to Stalin, loyal to the Soviet system, loyal to the ideology that had given them their position in this new society. Here was the guidance that people were looking for. When God died, the Soviet system took his place. To this generation of Soviet citizens, it was undeniable that this ideology was the truth. And now we get to the part everyone wants to talk about the social justice movement. It may seem only appropriate that I talk about social justice immediately after a discussion of the Soviet Union, because the ideologies behind them share frighteningly similar characteristics. I've heard the term cultural Marxism get thrown around a lot to describe social justice, and yeah, that's kind of an accurate assessment. Social justice always has talk about oppressors and victims, and how privilege in society is bestowed upon certain individuals by systems that facilitate an imbalance of power between the oppressor and the victim. White people oppress black people and other ethnic minorities. Men oppress women. Straight people oppress gay people. And the oppressor has all the power in society, which they use to oppress their victims. Sound familiar? The white people, the men, the straight people... They're the bourgeoisie, the oppressor class. What was once a designator of economic classes under classical Marxism has now been applied to all manner of demographics. And the ethnic minorities, the women, the LGBT folk, you guessed it, they're the equivalent of the proletariat. And just as in Soviet Russia, the modern-day bourgeoisie and proletariat has given way to the same sinister good-evil dichotomy, the same us-versus-them mentality. Social justice activists will tell you that they promote their ideology in the name of diversity, inclusion, equality, any number of nice-sounding buzzwords, words that every person in civil society should want to rally behind at face value. Who doesn't want to include people from all backgrounds and walks of life? We all like the stuff MLK had to say, don't we? Don't discriminate based on race, gender, sexuality, whatever. It's some pretty basic stuff that everyone agrees with. But that has a flip side. When social justice activists say that they're espousing these principles, this means that if you disagree with an activist, you must be against these principles, and you must be a bigot of some variety. If you think that third-wave feminism isn't in the best interest of women, you're a sexist and a misogynist. If you think that Black Lives Matter is spreading a false narrative or needs to address issues that are more pressing to black communities, you're a racist. Notice that none of these hypothetical disagreements are actually opposed to the basic principles of equality and inclusion. The quote-unquote misogynist really has the well-being of women at heart. The uh, racist cares about solving the issues facing black communities. But this goes ignored, because the people labeling others racists and sexists have never stopped to entertain the idea that they might be wrong. They assume the axiomatic truth of their position. They have the issue of the day totally figured out, they have all the answers, they are objectively right, and that means that any dissidence is objectively wrong. If you don't do inclusion and equality their way, you're just as bad as the real bigots who think that women belong in the home and that all black people are thugs. And don't tell me you haven't seen this kind of self-righteousness before. At some point, you've seen or heard some white person talk about how white people are the most evil bunch of bastards to ever walk the earth as though that person has themselves risen above the rest of their lowly white brethren. You've seen it, that elite, sanctimonious attitude of, I am more enlightened than you. 
all virtue signaling, white knighting, and self-gratification aside, I believe that this stems from this particular individual genuinely believing that they can't possibly be wrong. But remember, that's exactly how the revolutionaries of 1917 thought. They were so entrenched in their ideology that they were convinced that the way Marx saw the world was nothing short of reality, and they were more enlightened than all those who were still entangled in a bourgeoisie-dominated worldview. And, just like the revolutionaries, social justice activists believe that what they are doing is for the greater good, for justice. This is an extremely dangerous line of thinking. It's this kind of thinking that can justify actual discrimination against those who disagree with your position, stripping them of their rights, even ruining their lives. It's the line of thinking that drove the Red Terror and the Great Purge. And it's the line of thinking that is now driving no platforming policies at universities, violent protests at Donald Trump rallies, banning certain products from the free market, convicting men of rape without due process, and, on a more banal level, the sheer amount of vitriol directed towards non-progressive dissidents on the average day. But now let's look at social justice on a big picture level. How enlightened are these activists, really? We know that Stalin's Marxist ideology blinded him to the reality of his initiative's occasional mishaps, because he wouldn't budge on what he thought was the objective truth of how the world worked. I don't think social justice activists are any different. No matter what numbers you show them that contradict their narratives about oppressors and victims, no matter what logical inconsistencies in their worldview that you point out to them, they'll just stick to the same old talking points. Never mind that black-on-black -black crime is the leading cause of death in black communities and absentee fathers are severely exacerbating poverty. No, white people are the biggest adversity to black communities. Never mind that women are now overrepresented in universities and have a three-to-one hiring preference in STEM fields. No, we live in a male-dominated society that keeps women down. Never mind that an alarming percentage of the Muslim world believes and engages in the subjugation of women, the condemnation of homosexuals, and the execution of infidels, apostates, and free thinkers. No, you're stereotyping all Muslims based on a fringe element of the faith, and we can't have that. And you know why I think they won't budge? Because social justice is easy. It's easy to think of the world as a series of collectives with one-way power dynamics, rather than as a series of individuals with conflicting goals. Taking all those pesky individuals into account would create nuance, and it's hard to think about the world in a way that doesn't essentially break down into a series of easily digestible memes. It would be easy to think that all black people should care about the issues that Black Lives Matter talks about, that all women should subscribe to the ideas that feminism propagates, that all Muslims should be offended by any criticism of the doctrine of Islam. But, unfortunately, the world doesn't work that way. As easy as it would be to assume that all people of a social group think the same way, that each individual in the collective has the same life experience, no group of humans operates in a hive mind. And as soon as a black person disagrees with Black Lives Matter, or a woman disagrees with feminism, the narrative comes crumbling down. The social justice movement is rendered null and void. But they just keep going because white people can't not be the oppressor, because men can't not hold women down. That black person who disagrees with Black Lives Matter must have internalized racism. That woman who disagrees with feminism must have internalized misogyny. And thus, by stripping agency and independent thought from the very people it claims to protect, the progressive ideology is maintained. And these aren't the only easy ideas passed around in progressive circles. Take, for example, the idea that gender roles are a social construct, that somebody somewhere one day decided that males should have aggressive tendencies and that women should be inclined towards caregiving. The answer doesn't take into account that these tendencies evolved in humans as a result of the biological division of labor necessary for survival hundreds of thousands of years ago. In the past, men needed to be aggressive to hunt, women needed to be caring to raise children, and as we evolved, those tendencies stuck with us because they helped us to survive. Instead, progressives would prefer to pin the existence of gender roles on society, a vague term that doesn't specify what society actually means, what aspects of society gave rise to gender roles, or the processes by which this occurred. Nope, just toss the word society into the mix and you've got your answer, some big, mysterious entity that decides everything for us. And to be fair, society isn't technically a wrong answer. It was human society that evolved and eventually enforced these gender roles for the sake of survival. But the way progressives use the word society connotes a kind of otherness, a single monolithic entity outside of ourselves. 
And when you have that entity firmly cemented in your mind, it's so easy to peg it as the source of all the things you don't like. It's easier to think of gender roles as flowing from a single source, rather than understanding the complex biological relationships between genes, environments, and species. A lot of progressives also like to apply the same logic to body image. That society conditions us to prefer a certain body type by bombarding us with images of what a proper body should look like. Did it never occur to these people that maybe women with wider hips and larger breasts would more effectively birth and feed children? And that men with more muscular bodies would be faster runners and stronger hunters, and that selecting a mate with these features would beget evolutionary success? Did it never occur to them that people have preferences for these body types predisposed, and that media and advertising companies are simply appealing to our primal instincts? Nope, it's all society's fault. Case closed. And then there are the facile slogans and sound bites. Women make 77 cents to a man's dollar. One in five women on college campuses will be sexually assaulted. Statements so easily disprovable that one has to wonder why people can't see past the faulty logic and misleading figures. Well, there has to be something to complain about. There has to be some problem in the world that needs fixing. Otherwise, there's no social justice movement. There's no set of principles guiding the progressives on how to see the world, on how to live good and moral lives. There's no religion to rally behind and call reality. They have to figure truth and morality out on their own. And now, somehow, I'm going to tie it all back to Nietzsche. In my personal experience, humans look for guidance. We crave structure. We pursue a deeper meaning behind everything we do and how we live our lives. And in our desperation for answers, answers that are determined by someone else and given to us are the ones we gravitate towards the fastest, because they're easy. It's hard to truly assign meaning or value to something solely through the exercise of your critical faculties, so it's easier and much more palatable to let someone else do the heavy intellectual lifting. But when these answers are handed down from unquestionable authority, divine or not, there's no room for error, and when some part of observable reality contradicts those answers, you're forced to bend reality around them, rather than just accepting reality in its purest sense. This is what ideologies do to us. Whether it be religion, Marxism, or social justice, the ideological lens makes us see the world in a unique way, but it blinds us to reality. This is my call to attain truth not by ideology, not by easy answers, but by reason and by struggling with your thoughts. No human growth or acquisition of knowledge ever occurs without struggle, and maybe I'll do a video on Joseph Campbell later to explain why I think that's true. To sum it up, I encourage you to think things through yourself, to truly understand why you believe what you believe, and really find out if those beliefs are backed up by reality. Cheers, everyone.